Good evening. Welcome back to Kind of Change Sound of War. My name is Pal. Doing another live stream here for Vegan News and Views. Um, this is the fifth one. So, um, welcome everybody. Let me check in and see how many people we got. Hopefully, people will be joining. I have one person watching. Um, pretty excited. This uh, this series of uh, streams has been going quite well. I think um, people are really into it, and um, I'm going to keep doing them as there's always something to be talking about, and I have fun doing it. So, uh, it gives me a chance to cover a lot of things, um, kind of in an off the cuff manner. Um, a lot easier to put this together than some of the detailed videos I do. And lately, I've just been so busy; it's been hard to get you guys um, some of the content that I really want to share with you. So, I kind of enjoy doing these. And hopefully you do as well. So um, with that, I'm going to just jump right in. We got two people on. Guys, uh, let me know in the chat if uh, if you have any trouble hearing me. Hi, generally. <laughs> See, I went back to the late uh, time. <laughs> hopefully nobody's in work anymore. Or if they are, maybe they can watch while they're working. Um, cool. Uh, let me share my screen and we'll start. Uh, All right, so we've got um, quite a bit of news um, today to cover as well. And some of the things are building on um, some of the stuff we talked about in the past couple weeks. So uh, this, this first one is actually, um, I have to give props and shout out to um, direct action um, uh, everywhere, uh, again, for their efforts. Um, this article is basically, um, you know, highlighting some of the efforts they did in California to uh, expose kind of the um, underhanded nature of the dairy industry. Um, way back a couple of years ago in California, they um, signed into law something that I think was called Proposition 2, and it was basically trying to limit the, um, you know, the confinement that animals face in, um, you know, in farming practices uh, to, you know, what are quote unquote reasonable, um, you know, numbers. So it was like basically trying to get rid of the battery cages for hens and, um, you know, the um, crate confinement for like uh, pigs and um you know, the veal industry and things like that. And what they found, of course, is that when the, um, you know, the animal agriculture industry is told to do something, they find every loophole possible to basically not do what they're being asked to do. And at the very least, to not really uphold the spirit of the law, but maybe uphold the, the actual, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, like, like word for word, uh, what's written in the law, but, uh, certainly they try to go around it. Oh, Hey David, welcome, man. It's been a while since you've been on one of the live ones. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so basically this, uh, this article did a really good job of, um, showing kind of some of the footage, uh, that, um, uh, DXC uncovered when they went to investigate some of these, uh, Californian, um, uh, dairies where they had you know just row upon row of these uh poor baby uh you know um male calves um confined in what look to be the exact same um you know constraints that the veal industry used prior to the passing of proposition two and um what they kind of talk about in this article is that um the uh, the law is worded such that uh, the veal industry is limited from you uh, confining the baby uh, calves, but uh, what they are doing here is they're basically keeping the calves in the exact same confinement. They haven't changed any of the conditions, and you can see the drone footage um, that they obtained from this farm. Uh, you can see just row upon row upon row, and you know this is obviously just one farm that is doing this, and. Um, and what they are doing is they're basically just not labeling the meat that they are getting from these animals as veal. So they're basically just like doing the same exact thing they've done, except that they are not selling the meat that they get from these poor animals as veal. They're just selling it as regular beef. 
and um, getting away with, uh, you know, with the practice um, and without having to change uh, and invest in bigger spaces for the, for the males um, that are, you know, the byproduct of the dairy industry. This article is a really good read. I definitely recommend um, going through the whole thing, but, you know, that's it in a nutshell that these, um, you know, industries are going to keep uh, doing everything, everything they can, everything in their power to basically, you know, keep their costs low. And in the dairy industry, the, the male calves are a byproduct. They can't produce milk. They don't grow as fast as the um, male calves of the regular quote unquote beef industry. So they're often confined in little sheds and then sold as veal. But veal is kind of like unpopular because of like societal norms. I think most people are starting to realize how cruel the veal industry is. They don't want to associate it with um, dairy uh, because of, you know, just everybody wants to have a nice clean conscience. And um, yeah, so it's basically people are just, you know, having having the wool pulled over their eyes, so to speak. Um, so yeah, it's just a crazy thing. And this um, article also talks about some of the other um, really important, uh, you know, exposés that uh, DXC have done in the past. There was one from back in 2015 that I remember very well because um, it was, you know, right around the time I was I was uh, going vegan where they exposed one of the main suppliers to Whole Foods um, uh, for their turkeys. And uh, the farm that they exposed had the highest uh, possible, like, humane rating from the Whole Foods system. Uh, and the birds were in horrendous conditions and basically just like, you know, filthy, like straight up factory farm style, um, conditions that nobody kind of expected, um, you know, based on, uh, you know, like w what the marketing was, was, you know, giving them, which was that it was like a nice family farm, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The birds are out in the free range and you know, eating the grass and bugs and all that stuff. And, and that was absolutely not the case. So, um, yeah, so yeah, definitely read through this. And one of the, uh, things that they exposed was from Smithfield farms. They're, I think the world's largest pork producer, if I remember right. And, uh, it's a Chinese based company, um, or sorry, Chinese owned company, but they're based in Virginia. And um, they had an action against, uh, you know, them as well, exposing the cruelty and the poor conditions that they were keeping the animals in. And uh, the founder of DXE, Wayne uh, Seung, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, but anyway, um, he's facing up to 60 years in prison for the actions that they took there. So um, I, I encourage everybody to support uh, DXE. I think they're doing really important work. I talked about them a little bit last, um, you know, um, live stream. And uh, I definitely recommend, you know, everybody checking them out a bit and, uh, yeah, supporting them if you can. And and definitely if you're uh, in the U.S. and you're buying at Whole Foods, like, let your, um, you know, voice be heard. Like, buy the vegan products. Tell people, tell management that, uh, you know, you support their efforts and you want them to, uh, you know, drop charges against them. So, um, they have a restraining order against DXE in one of the stores. I believe it's the Berkeley store in California where the members aren't even allowed to step foot on the property. So it's pretty crazy. So yeah, definitely. Um, generally, yeah, you, you gave the thumbs up for D, uh, DXE. I, I really like them. So, um, check them out. All right. Um, this next one is actually just, uh, another, you know, um, like, you know, kudos to DXC because I talked about this, uh, I think it was a couple of live streams ago where in Santorini, the, um, hills are like really steep and it's just like very, um, busy tourist area and what they have and have had for many, many years now is they use donkeys to bring up, um, tourists from the low areas up to the top of the mountains. And the donkeys have like severe, you know, um, back injuries and open wounds and all this kind of stuff. They're basically just like, you know, uh, lugging up these big overweight people, um, as obesity is one of the, you know, most common things affecting, uh, you know, Western type, uh, diet <laughs> eaters. And, uh, the donkeys are suffering tremendously and, uh, DXC held a protest in Santorini and I covered this before, but, uh, they were actually attacked by some of the people who, um, 
you know, uh, use the donkeys and uh, make money off of them. And uh, there was that, and luckily that got out to some <clears throat> fairly mainstream media. And now um, Greece has actually banned uh, fat tourists from riding on donkeys. So it's just this really um, good news in the sense that uh, it's at least a step in the right direction. The donkeys are not banned. They can still bring people up and they are still used to transport other equipment and, you know, bags of cement and other heavy items. But there's at least now a limit theoretically as to how much weight you're allowed to pack, uh, pack on one of these animals. So they're limiting it to 100 kilograms. So a lot of these like super obese and really heavy people are not going to be allowed to ride <clears throat> on these donkeys anymore. So um, it's really crazy. Generally says uh, Santorini has a f yeah, effing lift for f lazy people. Yeah, so um, they should be using, um, you know, either their feet. Maybe they could lose some weight by walking up the stairs and, you know, I don't know. I mean, take your time, like bring some fruit, enjoy the views. Like, I don't know. It doesn't mean you have to like make poor animals suffer. So it's just really sad. And um, I think it's a good step in the right direction, though. They're saying that, you know, they're now going to be limited to 100K which is about one fifth of the animal's weight. I'm sure that that is like, you know, way better than, than what um, they have been forced to carry in the past. So, um, you know, I just think it's, it's, it's a good first step, but uh, um, yeah, I, I would encourage everybody to avoid riding the donkeys or riding any other kind of animals um, period. But uh, yeah, if you're going to go, I mean, at least, you know, um, this limits the amount of like super super heavy people that are going to be allowed to ride so so i think that's good news you can see this, how steep it is here and um yeah i think it's just so much better for the animals um if they weren't forced to do this at all but uh yeah at least they're you know that's some good <clears throat> some good news basically all right um I'm going to talk a lot about this uh, most recent report that came out about the climate change um you know, kind of uh, stats. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you probably have already read about this. Uh, the past uh, few days, it's been kind of all over the news. You can see this article from the BBC. Uh, they're basically, you know, had a, um, a big conference with all the world's leading climate scientists and everybody. Um, you know, basically, they, they met here in South Korea and this intergovernmental panel on climate change, IPCC, they published their report on the impact of global warming and, you know, where things are at. And previously, scientists have said that, uh, you know, we should try to keep the global warming to under two degrees if we don't want to see catastrophic, you know, problems. But now they're saying that really, like, it, it would be much better to keep it at like one and a half degree because there's like huge difference between you and that and the two degrees. And what they're saying is that uh, right now, even if people met the kind of like somewhat aggressive um, time uh, timelines and kind of initiatives that were agreed upon already, uh, it would still be not enough. And we would be probably facing, you know, more like a three degree uh, centigrade change um, instead of the two. So it's, it's actually very, very like a stark, um, you know, kind of warning. And uh, the report is very, um, I, I don't want to say like doomsday-ish, but uh, they really get into a lot of like some of the bad things that will happen if people do not take this seriously and don't make very drastic changes. So they're really trying to ring the alarm bell and tell governments that, uh, you know, they really need to make huge, huge um, investments and changes. And um, the article really does a lot uh, to highlight these efforts. So they're saying that, um, yeah, they're saying a uh, massive pile of cash every year, about 2.5% of global uh, domestic product, the value of all goods and services for two decades will be required to make these changes. And, um, you know, they're, they're talking a lot about, um, you know, what are the, some of the things that we can do. And I think this article was actually pretty good because they also said that, like, you know, um, they're encouraging individuals. Uh, so they're saying like, yeah, governments are going to have to do this and that and, you know, change and do regulations and environmental, you know, laws and all this kind of stuff. But what they also see say is that, look, you know, in order to meet these targets, it's not going to be possible without changes by individuals. So they're urging people to buy less meat, milk, cheese and butter and buy more locally sourced seasonal food and throw less of it away. 
and then of course the usual kind of environmental message drive electric cars walk or take a you know public transportation or ride a bike or whatever they're telling you you know use a clothesline to dry your clothes etc cetera, etc cetera. so but i think it's a good message because they're saying like look people have power to help and do a lot and we can't you know just rely on government to do it alone and you know if anything maybe just they say make sure you're electing politicians who provide options around public transport and push for environmental, uh, you know, change. Um, this is a kind of a crazy chart that they had here. It shows you kind of the hottest uh, day. Um, yeah, it says hottest that this location has ever been. And then it has like on this date or in this month or since records began. And you can see that this is just from, you know, the springtime this year up until kind of like where we are now, I think in like August or whatever. And you can just see like how many of these, um, you know, points are, uh, you know, the hottest um, uh, temperature for that day, for that given day. Those are those orange uh, spots. And then these like reddish pinkish ones are for the month. And the really dark ones are since records began. And for some of you guys watching, I know you're in Northern Europe, and um, David, if you look like, you know, there's a bunch of the really dark red ones, um, you know, up in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and, you know, all across here in, in, uh, in Asia as well, um, you know, above China, India, there's just like so many of these. And um, it's really kind of scary when you see this kind of, uh, you know, mapped out here. If you scroll over, you can see the ones in the U.S. as well. And there's quite a few here, too, that... Uh, are the hottest ever recorded um, since they've had like records and there's a bunch that are you know for the given date so it's it's actually quite scary and lots same pretty much the same story for africa south america doesn't seem to be quite as bad or they might just not have data i i imagine i don't know for some of these places that are more remote i don't know um there's another uh in interesting chart here in this uh article as well but i just want to go through these five things that they're basically saying will need to happen in order to uh, limit the climate change to the one and a half degree so they're saying the global emissions of co2 need to decline by 45 percent from the two, uh, 2010 levels by 2030 now if you look at that that's only 12 years so we have 12 years to cut um uh, CO2 emissions by 45%. That's an extremely ambitious target. Like, I can't even imagine that we're going to get there. And um, hi, Essie. Welcome. Um, another point here, the second point, renewables are estimated to provide up to 85% of global electricity by 2050. Again, a huge, um, you know, ambitious target, like 85% of global electricity. I mean, right now we have so much coal, we have so much other you know, options and very little in the way of like, you know, um, solar or wind or whatever. Um, they basically expect uh, coal to go to zero or, or close to zero, which again is like very, very ambitious. Fourth point is uh, they're saying that they need 7 million square kilometers of land uh, to farm energy crops. And it says a bit less than the size of Australia. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just an insane, you know, figure. Like, where do you get that amount of land? You know, like, what are they going to do? Cut down more forests? And there's another article that uh, talks about that as well, which I can show you guys in a second. And then they're saying global net zero emissions by 2050. So again, just very, very aggressive to maintain this one and a half, um, you know, uh, degree centigrade um, change. And uh, it's a very, very scary thing. Um, this is a really cool chart. They have um, 20th century average is that black line kind of in the middle. And uh, the months are down at the bottom. And the uh, years uh, are being marked here. Sorry, I, I scrolled too far. You can see the years um, are the various lines that are going. And you can see that there's some change, you know, like some of them go back down a little bit. Some of them are higher. But just as a general, uh, you know, um, progression you can see that very clearly the temperature is rising and it's not just on a given month it's not just on a given year it's just a very steady progression so you know this is just pretty scary and alarming 
And, you know, it's looking like 2018 is going to be, again, the fourth warmest year ever. And you can see that the 10 warmest years, they were all the most, you know, recent uh, years. So it's, it's pretty scary. Um, this is the last part that I want to highlight from this article. Uh, and they show, you know, the, um, what is some of the impact um, because, you know, these, these numbers are kind of like hard to wrap your head around, but, but I thought this really jumped out at me. So they say global sea level will rise about 10 centimeters, which is four inches uh, more if we let warming go to two degrees versus the one and a half. That may not sound like much, so it's four inches of, of rise, um, but they say, uh, but keeping it to one and a half versus two means that 10 million fewer people would be exposed to the risks of flooding. I mean, 10 million people, you know, getting displaced by flooding, that's a huge number of people. Um, it's just very, very kind of like crazy when you see it um, put out like that. And uh, this is just another similar um, drawing which shows the um, polar, uh, the Arctic um, ice, um, uh, what do you call it, like during the minimum, um, when it's like the warmest in the summer, like how far the ice recedes back. And you can see that the black line drawn is from when they have, I think, when they first started, what is it? Oh, no, so from 1980. Okay, so they have from 1980, they show, like, up till, you know, basically recent time. I forget what the last year is that they show. 2018, yeah. So, you know, you can see that it's just, like, more and more of the, um, you know, of the ice in the Arctic is melting. So crazy stuff. Um, what did you say, dude? I want to know what the parents of these children who will experience consequences think about this. The same with World Health Organization and cancer and kids. Fine, you don't care about yourself, but the kids. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, I think it's we're kind of past the point at which it's okay for people to think like, well, you know, there's some debate about this, or uh, you know, you know, I, I don't believe in climate change or whatever. I mean. These, these facts and figures and the science behind it is just so, you know, thorough now that I, I just, I find it shocking when, when I, when I still hear from people that, that deny that, um, you know, there is climate change and that it's something that we need to do something about. And, you know, people argue like whether it's man-made or not, but I mean, I think even that is a laughable discussion, but let's just, you know, for the sake of argument, say that it's not, even then, don't you think that you should try to, you know, counter the effects uh, by reducing the human impacts that you can? And obviously, one of the easiest things we can do is to, you know, adopt a uh, plant-based diet and, um, you know, stop uh, doing the large-scale animal agriculture, which is just the, you know, the biggest train um, that is, uh, is, is controllable and is easy to change. So, anyway... I think this article is actually really good and definitely encourage everybody to check it out. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of good news. Last time I told you guys that uh, Glenn Hughes, the bass player from uh, Deep Purple back in the day, was uh, was vegan now. And here's another bass player who's vegan, which I didn't know about. Um, Blink-182's bassist, uh, Mark Hoppus, is also a vegan and um, apparently has been tweeting some pro-vegan uh, tweets and um, also his bandmate uh, Travis Baker, the drummer. Where did they show here? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, recently supported a march of signs for animal rights, and they're saying the band's former private chef Mary Mattern uh, has written plant-based recipe books and opened a vegan deli. So I think this is really cool. Um, you know, definitely check out some of the stuff uh, here, but. Um, you know, he's, he's like posting here a little bit about um, a dog that he rescued and he's very vocal about um, animals and pets and, uh, and basically encouraging people to go vegan. So I think that's really cool. <clears throat> and um, yeah, this next one is kind of also good news, but kind of disguised as somewhat <laughs> weird news to me is that uh, there's this uh, British uh, show, which is called The Great British Bake Off. I'm not familiar with it, I'll be honest. Uh, maybe some of the UK viewers um, know it or like it or don't like it, I don't know. And um, they apparently have like a, I don't know, I think it's almost kind of like one of these like 
like, uh, you know, cooking, um, uh, what do you call it, contest shows where they have a bunch of contestants on and, and then they, you know, put them under some stressful, ridiculous condition and then they tell them they have to bake from these ingredients or do this or that and then they get judged and whatever. But the, but the show is basically now going to have a week um, where they're going to have vegan recipes. So the contestants are going to have to cook um, and bake uh, vegan um I guess, you know, treats or whatever, whatever it is that they're baking there. And, uh, so I think they have to have like a, you know, vegan meringue and whatever. And, um, they're saying how, I guess like a bunch of people are responding, um, kind of negatively on Twitter. Um, I think they had some examples here somewhere, but, uh, I can't find them right now, but anyway, it was just kind of ridiculous that like anybody would take offense to this. And there, there were like several people who were like posting things about this on Twitter, like, you know, like, I'm not going to watch the show anymore and, like, just crazy stuff that, like, I mean, why would you take offense to, you know, just having a vegan bake-off challenge? Like, this is just, like, it, it's, it's like, the solution to so many problems. And I just think it's kind of funny that, like, people would somehow be offended by this and, and they're like, no, I need eggs and butter and, you know, things. And it's just crazy. So, anyway, I think it's good. If nothing else, it gets people talking and be, and um, also realizing that, like, you can bake and make just about any kind of pastry and just about any kind of cake or, you know, sweet that you can with animal products, you can make a vegan version of it. So I think that's good. Hopefully it gets more people, you know, to realize that and then they'll ask for that option. <laughs> this um, next uh, article comes from Canada. And uh, this one is interesting because uh, apparently it depends on which, um, like, uh, I, guess, I don't know if it's called the province or whatever, but like which part of Canada you're in, the um, uh, laws concerning the keeping of exotic pets varies from like area to area. And in some places they don't have any restrictions basically, except for like, you know, just really few things like, like you can't own pit bulls or something. And like, I forget which one I think it was Ontario, but um, they're saying how it's a huge problem in, uh, um, exotic animals. So people have like monkeys and, um, pythons and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, uh, several people have been killed by these exotic pets as well. So, um, I think they highlighted, I can't remember if it was a tiger or a lion or somebody like, oh yeah, here it is. Um, uh, a young mother was mauled to death by a pet tiger. Then there were two young children who were killed by a pet python. So just crazy stuff. Like, I don't know why people decide they need to keep these kind of animals like in, in you know in their homes um you know as a vegan i i actually don't really support like um the keeping of pets i mean we have a dog ourselves but uh we we got her before we were vegan and um you know i certainly think there's a huge difference though between having like a dog or um you know a cat or some other type of animal that is somewhat kind of like you know, kind of domesticated and used to living, you know, with people in homes and they don't have like really crazy, you know, requirements for like space and habitat and things like that. Um, I mean, these people are just like way over the line and, um, yeah, I don't, I definitely don't think it's the same thing to have a dog versus having a lion or a tiger or whatever. And obviously it's like, there's serious consequences to this. And what happens is people get these pets um, that have like really like, uh, you know, <laughs> like demanding kind of like upkeep and, and, um, and you got to like take care of them. And, and then when they realize like, oh, wow, this is a big inconvenience, they get rid of the animals. Um, this happens with birds and, um, snakes and stuff. People let them loose in the wild, then it wreaks havoc in the ecosystems. So it's like, it's a real big problem. And this article is basically just saying that, uh, they want to, um, plug some loopholes in, uh, I think this was in British Columbia specifically, if I remember right. And, um, yeah, they just want to basically like ban everything that's not a typical, uh, you know, kind of like domesticated, um, you know, animal from being kept as a pet. So I don't know. I think if anything, it's a good first step. Uh, this next one is a very cool, um, article in the sense that uh, it's quite sad actually, but I, I'm happy to see it in the sense that uh, Monsanto uh, lost a the first round of a lawsuit where they had to pay out a huge settlement. I think, what was it, like 200, yeah, $289 million in damages 
uh, to a man who, you know, has uh, terminal cancer and he got it from the exposure to Roundup. Uh, so he was uh, working, I believe, at a school or something like that where they had like big grounds to, you know, keep up um, like, uh, you know, baseball field or soccer field or that kind of thing. And he was using that stuff to control the weeds. And, um, you know, he got cancer from it. And the the jury, you know, believed the argument that uh, that it was from the exposure of these chemicals, um, you know, within Roundup. And um, now this article is talking about a whole bunch of other people that are kind of waiting in the lines um, with very similar stories. So people who've already died, their family members are suing, or people who uh, have cancer themselves and are suing. And they're kind of hoping that this is sort of like the uh, lawsuits that were raised against the tobacco industry, that people are going to be, you know, getting some justice in the form of monetary compensation from Monsanto because they are alleging that Roundup is just so safe and all this kind of stuff, when in reality, like, it really does seem like it causes cancer. The article does a great job of also mentioning some stuff where there was, like, um, kind of shady dealings going on where, like, certain, um, you know, reports that came out um, had involvement from Monsanto. Like, they were, like, basically writing journal articles about its safety and all this kind of stuff. Uh, really shady, scary kind of stuff. And um, I think this article does a good job of kind of, you know, showing what they are doing and how they are trying to delay uh, lawsuits um, for people that are actually, like, you know, suffering from cancer and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, like in one of the cases, the, the yeah, here it is. The the lawyers have argued they um, have a right to a speedy trial. That's the the um, representatives of the uh, the people with cancer. But Monsanto, however, however, has opposed the request, and you know um, they're basically saying that like, look, their cancer's in remission, so there's no reason to rush this. And it's just crazy stuff. I mean, anybody who like thinks that these chemicals are going to be, you know, okay for you are obviously not really you know aware of the the actual science and and what these poor people have suffered um through so i definitely recommend reading through this and uh definitely you know do not use any of this stuff in your home like anywhere um and yeah we need to really start changing our food production to you know not use this stuff it's there's like some pretty interesting statistics here about how widely used it is and just it's really scary stuff, man. Like, uh, very, very bad stuff. So, oh, and, uh, and also I didn't bring up the link, but, um, check out Dr. Pam Popper. Uh, she had some pretty good, um, insights about, uh, um, Monsanto and the lawsuit as well. So definitely check that out. Uh, this next study is kind of one for the guys, but for ladies as well to know about. Um, it talks about how uh, sperm count has been getting lower and lower among men, like on average, for the past several decades. And this study basically looked at samples from fertility centers in the U.S. and Spain from 2002 through 2017. And what they found is basically, um, you know, uh, a huge increase in the number of people seeking fertility treatment. Many of these men were actually quite young. I think they said uh, here the average age of men receiving fertility treatment is 36 years old. So, you know, that's actually quite young if you think about it. I mean, most guys, you should be, you know, not having any kind of issues at that age. You know, it, it's possible if, like, you wanted to uh, help conceive a child at a much older age that your sperm count would be lower, but that's quite young. So um, they're talking about how, um, you know, these um, numbers have been getting worse and worse. There's more and more people coming and, and uh, getting the treatments. And they also say that this uh, research, um, you know, basically it says comes a year after another research, which showed 59% drop in sperm counts since 1973. And they're basically attributing this to environmental factors like plastics and smoking and obesity. Um, and if you think about that, I mean, uh, a vegan diet is the only, uh, diet that on average, the people who follow it have a healthy BMI, you know, and people aren't overweight. So like you could take out one of the risk factors right there, um, just by not being obese. And one of the easiest ways you can do that is to follow a whole food plant-based diet. 
And uh, the other factor there is plastics. I've talked a lot about, you know, um, bioaccumulation of uh, toxins and, and various, um, you know, chemicals. And, uh, and I think, again, you know, they are usually bioaccumulated in the fats of animals. So if you eliminate the consumption of those fats, then you're eliminating a huge part there as well. And if you don't smoke, well, that's an easy thing to do. Um, hopefully, if you didn't start, don't start. And if you do, you know, smoke, then stop smoking, basically. So a lot of this is, is kind of in, in our own hands to, you know, um, treat. So, but uh, interesting, interesting numbers for anybody who is, you know, trying to, uh, to conceive. It's like very um, good science uh, to show that a whole food plant-based diet can help. So interesting. This is an article that I found about the number of vegans in the Israeli army. They're basically saying that it's almost 20 fold. So it's like, yeah, just over 1900% increase um, just from a few years ago. And um, they're basically saying that, uh, yeah, one in 18 members of the um, army identifies as vegetarian. Now, they, and then they kind of like blur the lines because they keep talking about vegetarian and vegan. But they're, they're basically saying that uh, people can ask for, um, you know, vegan meals. And many of the people in the army identify as vegan. And they're also talking about other countries that have adopted a more, um, you know, plant-based, uh, you know, meal um, plan so that uh, they can, like, uh, reduce their environmental impact and all this kind of stuff. I forget where they talked about that. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. Finland's army announced that its defense forces would serve two fully vegetarian meals for lunch and dinner weekly in a bid to reduce its carbon footprint. All garrisons will also provide vegan meals upon request. The new dishes are centered around high carb ingredients like potatoes, pasta, soy protein, and vegan meat by vegetarian brand corn. So, I mean, I don't um, really support any kind of like military, you know, intervention or action. I'm a pacifist at heart, but uh, I, I think this is great news. And, um, and I think honestly that uh, by going vegan, I think a lot of times people's mentality also changes and um, probably helps reduce their aggression. So I think if, if nothing else, like this is, uh, a, again, a bit of good news. All right. Um, I want to do a shout out to uh, Tofu Tommy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with his channel. I know many of you guys are because I see you commenting on some of his videos. But uh, for anybody who's watching who doesn't know, um, Tofu Tommy has a YouTube channel. He's very active on Twitter and Instagram. He uh, does a lot of um, activism. He does um, vigils. Uh, he's, he's very active in the SAVE movement. And uh, I just wanted to share this post that he put up on his Instagram, which talks again about the um, fox cub hunting. So they were out uh, protesting um, with the League Against Cruel Sports in Scotland, uh, trying to raise awareness and talk to people, uh, you know, directly in the um, in the public to basically explain that uh, when people are doing these, you know, fox hunting, um, you know, uh, endeavor endeavors or whatever this sport, if you can call it that, um, the hounds that they use are not. Um, uh, normally inclined to uh, you know f attack and kill the foxes and what they do is they have to actually train them to do that and they get little baby fox cubs and they basically train the dogs to attack and kill them and, and rip them to pieces so it's just an insane thing that like if most people even knew that they would hopefully be opposed to the whole um, fox hunting thing you know outright and that's what they were trying to do is to tell people about this so Definitely show some love. Um, head on over, subscribe to uh, Tommy's channel, and let him know I sent you. Uh, he's he's good people. Yeah, I say I totally agree, man. Um, Tommy's just so supportive and, and great. He he really does a lot of uh, good, I think, in the community, and, and highlights a lot of other uh, smaller channels as well too. So uh, and and then if anybody um, has a eating disorder or a past of eating disorder or, you know, has, you know, struggled with, with recovery from those kinds of things. Um, he does quite a few videos on those topics as well as he himself, uh, you know, is recovering from an eating disorder. So, um, he definitely is somebody that, uh, you know, you can go to for help or, you know, asking for questions. He's, he's very, very responsive to comments and, uh, tweets and everything. So definitely check him out. 
And he also pointed out to me that today, uh, October 10th, is World Mental Health Day. So he had a really good post on uh, Twitter that I saw because I wasn't even aware of this. But um, yeah, today is basically uh, Mental Health Day. And um, they're trying to uh, basically, um, you know, like, like let people know about the struggles, especially of young people. There's some kind of pretty scary statistics in here. Sorry, I'm just reading Jennerly's comments. Dogs are not legally allowed to kill the fox. They are supposed to only flush the fox out. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, but I guess the the point of the the um, the activism was to highlight the fact that they train the dogs to do that by basically killing these little fox cubs. So it's certainly not a uh, not a pretty thing. And I think, uh, I mean, I've definitely seen like videos posted on Twitter where uh, you know there was like a video of like the fox literally being kind of like ripped to shreds by the dog so I, I mean if they're not supposed to do that like i don't know again it's like maybe that's the like the intention but like in practice like like that's the theory but in practice that's not what happens so uh yeah mental health um this article talks a little bit about the rates of um depression among adolescents and they're basically saying that uh by the age of 14, um, uh, half of all mental illness begins by that age. And, um, you know, many of the cases go untreated or undetected. And they're basically saying depression is the third leading cause. Um, you know, and then they're saying suicide is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. That's insane. I mean, obviously, like with people that young, you kind of hope that they're not really, um, you know, dying from diseases because, you know, many of the chronic diseases we have in uh, modern day um, take decades to develop. So, I mean, I kind of expect like, you know, accidents or something else to be high. But uh, yeah, to, to, to think that um, suicide is the second leading cause is just really scary. And they're basically saying like, yeah, the use of alcohol or drugs can make it um, even worse. Um, yeah, so I think just being aware that, you uh, you know, of, of what kind of signs um, people exhibit if they're having um, issues or if they're struggling. And uh, I think it's just really important and we should all try to be more aware. And if you see somebody struggling that you know, uh, if they're being bullied maybe, or they're just stressed out um, from regular kind of like life things, like, you know, let's try to be there for each other and, and be a, you know, helpful, um, you know, like let's lend, it, lend an ear and let people, you know, vent and, just let them know that you're there for them and that there's resources out there for, for, you know, for people that they can get help. I think it's very important. So yeah, shout out to Tommy. Thanks for bringing this to my attention. Um, it generally says, yeah, they, they breed the foxes to keep the sport going. Yeah, they probably do. And I don't know the exact numbers or how that's done, but I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that, uh, that is, you know, what, what is happening. And I just don't even understand like <clears throat> how in today's day and age, like, in a civilized quote unquote country, like, um, this kind of, you know, like cruel barbaric act can be viewed as a sport. I mean, it's like, it's just nowhere. I mean, I think it's like some of the worst kind of, um, I don't know, hunting there is like, I think like subsistence hunting is like, you know, obviously would, would try to get people to, you know, see the ethical argument against it or whatever, and, and have people to, you know, eat more plant-based as much as possible. But, it, you know, I think like even something like going out and shooting a deer and then eating it, it's like very different than just going out and doing something like this against a fox, which has like just no, like, I'm sure people are not eating the foxes. Um, I don't think it justifies killing the deer either, but like at least there you have that kind of excuse that like, well, you know, the people are out there and they're eating it and it's an important food source and blah, blah, blah. But with the fox, it's just, it's like, in my mind, it's like the uh, the bullfighting. It's just like cruelty for the sake of cruelty. There's no, there isn't even this kind of like ulterior kind of like almost motive of like, well, you're eating the, you know, the animal. Um, it's just this crazy thing. So anyway, um, this next one is a pretty sad uh, story. They recently had a ton of, um, these deep water whales wash ashore in Scotland. So this just happened. I think this was supposed to be on the second. So this was like eight days ago. They uh, found 
75 of these deep water whales. I think they're called uh, beaked whales. Yeah. Um, uh, they washed up on the Scottish and Irish coasts uh, between August and September of this year. And uh, they don't know what's causing them, but they suspect that they might have been kind of messed up by sonar. And um, it's really crazy that uh, I guess like a lot of uh, military use and some other kind of like, I guess, uh, uses of sonar makes so much noise like in the water that the whales can become disoriented or spooked. And because these are very deep diving uh, whales, they can go something like, I think, two miles under the surface of the water, something like that. They can be underwater for like just some ridiculous amount of time. I forget where they wrote that stuff, but uh, I don't want to scroll through too much. There's sadly many kind of like pictures of them. But uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, they, they basically go down very far into the water. And if they get spooked and they come up too fast to the surface because they're trying to escape, uh, I guess the sound or maybe they just kind of get, like get disoriented from the sonar, um, they can get the bends. So just like people can get like um, decompression sickness, um, the, these whales can be affected in the same way. And then they can actually die from the bubbles that get formed um, in their uh, blood. So it's just a really kind of crazy thing. And I only just wanted to really mention it because you know, sometimes the impact that we have on these wonderful, beautiful creatures that live all around us in the world is, is stuff that you don't even think about. Like we've talked so much about the use of uh, plastic and then the plastics ending up in the ocean the past few weeks. But like, you know, this is another thing where like we have like military and, you know, other kind of like, I guess, like uses of, of sonar, but especially military, I think is usually the thing I think of because it's like submarines are pretty much exclusively used by military. I mean, I'm sure there's some like research use and whatever, but for the most part, I think like the sonar is used heavily by them um, to navigate around and to look for other, you know, countries, um, submarines and stuff. And uh, it's like killing whales. And there's documented cases of this in other areas of the world, um, off the coast of California and other places where um, it's confirmed that uh, that's what caused it. So it's just, it's really kind of crazy thing. And um I hope someday that, uh, you know, these kinds of things can be avoided. It's really crazy. This uh, article is kind of uh, coming on the back of the earlier one that I mentioned today about the climate change report. Um, this one talks specifically about the impact to insects. And what they're saying is that uh, if we are, you know, going to hit the um, one and a half of, uh, degrees Celsius, you know, ambitious goal, um, the loss of insects is, is still going to happen, but it's going to be a lot lower. If we uh, go to the two um, degree or the three degree, like it's going to be pretty, pretty catastrophic. So you can actually see um, this chart here. It says insect ranges could be seriously cut by the climate change. Percentage of species losing more than half their range by tw uh, 2100. So that's in, you know, roughly whatever that is, 80 years, yeah, 82 years from now. Um, they're saying that, uh, like over half of the, um, uh, sorry, not over half, almost half, it's 49% of the insects would um, basically, um, you know, lose half their range. It's like, it's crazy. Like, um, you can also see the other kinds of things they are basically showing like certain plants that will also be impacted very heavily. So it's not just bugs, but the bugs are the red bar and the plants are the orange bar and e even vertebrates. So those are like, you know, the animals like um, up to and including like uh, um, people, <laughs> like um, they will be affected as well. And in the worst case scenario there, the 3.2 uh, degrees Celsius change, it's like I, I put that roughly at like 25% or 26. So like 26% of vertebrate species would be losing more than half their range uh, if we, um, you know, don't like limit the, um, the global warming, um, below 3.2. So it's just really, really scary. And this again, puts things into perspective, like, um, you know, it's just, it's really, really crazy. Like it's a very serious thing. And they're talking about how, you know, even these estimates are probably, um, slightly under, um, the reality because they're talking about like the compounding, um, 
you know, problem when you lose like habitat. And then, um, there's, there's, what did they say? Uh, here it is. Um, they said the new work had taken account the ability of species to migrate, but had not been able to include the impact of lost interactions between species as ranges contract or of the impacts of more extreme weather events on wildlife. As both of those would increase the losses of range, Warren said the estimates of losses made were likely to be underestimates. So just very, very scary stuff. Like, you know, people definitely need to take this very seriously. And um, I encourage everybody to read this and kind of share it, you know, with people that you know and um, really highlight kind of the, the impact that we're having. And then, of course, you know, it's a perfect segue to talk about, you know, adopting a whole food plant-based diet. Um, this one is, again, I, I said I was going to talk about this report a lot. Um, this is another kind of, you know, article, different source. They also are talking about how um, the scientists who are working, uh, who worked on this report, were struggling to basically sound the alarm in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, you know, of course, like in a scientific manner, but to really kind of get people to understand the urgency um, behind these changes and the fact that they really need to be done. And um, again, it's a great article. Uh, one thing that um, that I just want to play for you guys from it is just this little chart here at the top. So this basically visual this visualization shows the temperature anomalies by country. So each one of these little you know circles is a different country, and these are from 1880 through uh, 2017. And this is based on data from NASA. You can see <coughs> the um, uh, temperature anomalies are color coded. So minus, um, you know, uh, degrees all the way up to um, plus degrees. And um, you can see that as you get into, you know, the 50s, 60s, the warmer um, uh, anomalies start really getting like, you know, present. And at first it's kind of like more you know, the mild one degree Celsius, which is the that like light orange, and then you start seeing all these red ones. And when you see them all in a row like that, I mean, that's when it really starts to kind of like hit home. Um, sorry, let me mute this. Um, so yeah, I just thought that chart was like pretty, pretty interesting and um, definitely well worth uh, a read through this article as well. They talk about different approaches that people are talking about and how to limit things and this also talks a little bit about um you know meat tax and other kinds of things that people you know might have to resort to if uh you know individuals aren't you know changing so i think this is a, a good article as well um this one is again related to this uh report this one talks about the idea that uh, there is a way to do um, carbon sequestering. There's different uh, options. And one of the uh, things they also talk about is um, growing um, different kinds of uh, like biomass to produce energy. And uh, it's pretty controversial, I guess, because they haven't really tested it on a, um, like a large scale and also they're basically saying that uh, it would mean, you know, like needing a lot of land to do it. And like I showed in the other article, you know, they need uh, the land the size of Australia. Um, and so what they're saying is like, what that means is it probably means further stress and pressure put on the forests that we have. And if that's what's going to happen, you know, it's just going to be that much more pressure on the forests. So they're basically saying that uh, without the forests, it's just that much worse. And they're saying that uh, here, what was it? Yeah, they're saying raising the world's forest would release more than 3 trillion tons of carbon dioxide, more than the amount locked in identified global reserve of oil, coil, uh, oil, coal, and the gas. So, I mean, we really need the uh, forests, and they're basically saying uh, we have to restore them. So I think, like, yeah, it's it's a really dire situation. I think people don't. Uh, fully understand kind of you know what we're facing a lot of people just um, think that this is like way off in the future and it's really not um, you know they're basically putting these kind of you know like 2030 2050 kind of like deadlines these are well within the lifetime of many of the people who are watching this right now and hopefully you know of uh, 
you know, future generations. And if we're going at the rate we're going, like there's going to be some serious upheavals coming because, you know, when you have people like leaving, you know, millions of people having to leave their home because of flooding and um, desertification and food scarcity and all this kind of stuff, like, I mean, I can only imagine the stress that that will cause and, you know, wars will probably be breaking out over food and water and even just dry land, I guess, at some point for some of the smaller island nations and people that live in coastal areas. And um, just because of the nature of, uh, like, shipping and travel um, from historic times on, uh, many of the world's largest cities are based, you know, on the water or near the water. And um, I think, you know, this is obviously pretty, pretty important. Um, going along the kind of like sea and ocean route, it's kind of amazing to me that, uh, you know, The Guardian does a pretty good job, I think, of, of doing articles about kind of, um, you know, environmental issues. But then they have this article, which I just found like, again, it could be like something from The Onion. It's almost funny. They're basically saying that, uh, you know, uh, the impact on the ocean and the aquatic life is really bad. Um, many species of fish are being overfished and their um, numbers are completely on the verge of collapse. They're totally unsustainable. And they're basically telling people eat more pollock and less squid to f save fish stocks. So they're basically just shifting the problem from one species or one type of, you know, seafood, quote unquote, to another. And um, they're basically saying that, you know, it's like, uh, there's unclear labeling on seafood, so the shoppers don't really know if their um, uh, choice of uh, seafood is sustainable or not. And then they're basically making these like ridiculous suggestions. Um, they're saying like, you know, go ask your fishmonger, supermarket, fish counter, or restaurant whether their choice is sustainable. This to me reminds me of like in The Simpsons when Homer goes to buy a car and there is a... Um, price written on the windshield of like whatever it was i don't know you know four thousand dollars or whatever and he like kind of runs over he sees the car he likes it he asks the salesman like hey is this car five thousand dollars and the guy like rubs off the price and he's like it is now and this is kind of like you ask a supermarket fish counter person like is this a sustainable choice like what are they going to tell you they're going to say yes yes it is <laughs> like I mean, it's just ridiculous, like, that they're trying to somehow put this back on, you know, the consumer to ask, like, the person who's selling them the, the product. Like, why would that person have any kind of incentive to tell you the truth? If they say, no, it's not sustainable, then you're obviously not going to buy it. Or, well, hopefully you wouldn't. But um, I think it's just, you know, missing the point entirely. And what they are... Uh, you know, doing in this article is just kind of funny. Like, I think this part was the part that got me the best. It said, it said while squid uh, caught using jigs, a type of hook and line that is very selective compared with trawling, from the channel in Scotland is rated a three. This is on this uh, sustainability report. They're basically saying that uh, elsewhere, if the squid is, you know, um, uh, caught using these trawling methods, they have the worst rating, which is a, uh, a five um you know, I guess a five minus maybe, I don't know, which means consumers are advised to avoid it. So it's just like, um, you know, like, come on, man. It's like, it's even the same species, but it's just depending on how it's caught. Like things aren't even labeled correctly. And, and I've seen other articles where they even show that like, even sometimes um, the species of the fish is labeled wrong. So when they've done samples, they've sent it off for DNA uh, testing. The samples come back that, uh, like stores are basically lying and restaurants are lying. So you order something that you think is like whatever, I don't know, sea bass or something. And then it turns out that it's something completely different. Just really crazy stuff. And, um, you know, this, uh, you know, they're, they're basically just, um, you know, talking about how like going, get these different kind of species, uh, that it's going to somehow, you know, make it better or something. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's, it's just really, ridiculous um and then they're basically saying here that now with the brexit coming up um they're basically saying like the e uk prepares to leave the eu and tries to secure a bigger share of the fish market now could be the time to consider new options it's like yeah they should consider vegan options <laughs> like don't don't catch the fish and then you know leave them alone in the oceans um yeah david i, I was like shocked at this article i think it's just it's just so poor <laughs> like anyway and then 
kind of like, here's the vegan option right here. Uh, there is a new company doing vegan seafood. So this company called Good Catch, um, they're basically uh, doing a plant-based alternative um, to replace like tuna and um, like fresh kind of uh, different kinds of fish that you would cook and like use in different kinds of meals. Seems like a really interesting, um, you know, uh, idea. So they are basically looking to be, uh, have a global presence and they want to have like many different kinds of like, um, you know, like options available. So they're saying like they want to do everyday, uh, here it is, sandwich staples like canned tuna to upscale exotic appetizers like oysters. And, um, you know, they basically, uh, you know, are just talking about how like it, worldwide, um, you know, uh, like fish or you know seafood is like a huge part of like many people's diets can't remember where that part was um anyway oh yeah here it is so they say um nearly 40 percent of protein consumed by humans comes from seafood so that's a huge huge amount i i had no idea honestly um I, 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 uh, I would have assumed it was smaller, but that's, that's a huge amount. And then they also, you know, point out here that, uh, um, 85% of marine fish has been either fully exploited or overfished according to the United Nations food and agriculture, um, organization. So if you guys are familiar with, um, Sea Shepherd, uh, they are a wonderful organization and they've done a lot to highlight the kind of state of the oceans and, um, talk about how, you know, the, you know, the fish are being, you know, overfished and there is no sustainable fishing. It's just a, I mean, it's, it's just a myth. There is no benefit from like switching from one type of fish to another fish. All you're doing is just moving the problem from one species to another. And, um, it's, you know, a lot of people have said that there's going to be fishless, fishless oceans, um, you know, well within our lifetime. But I think, I can't remember the exact date now, maybe somebody in the comments might know, I think it's like 20. 48 or something like that like i don't know some some like really soon you know number so um yeah they're basically also pointing out in this article how um unsustainable it is and um you know not environmentally friendly to do farm fish either so they're saying here that uh, it can take as much as 2.4 pounds of wild fish to produce one pound of farmed salmon because what they're doing is they use the um wild caught fish to basically the, the species that are not desirable to sell, they, you know, um, like grind those up and they feed them to like fish and, um, uh, you know, like factory farmed <laughs> conditions. So it's, it's, you know, really terrible. And they're basically saying that it's time consuming as well. Farmed fish takes upwards of two and a half to three years to harvest in a tank. I wasn't aware of that either. Um, so they're certainly a lot slower to grow than, uh, than the land animals like, like pigs and stuff like that. So pretty, pretty interesting that uh, this company is doing this. And I think, you know, I applaud them. Um, we recently had some vegan fish sticks with uh, the kids here at home. And um, if anything, I think the taste was just too realistic. My wife literally couldn't eat the fish sticks. She's never liked fish. She's always kind of hated the kind of like, um, I don't know, I guess like taste and like smell and texture of fish. And these fish sticks were just like so spot on. Like I kid you not. I mean, I haven't had fish sticks in, I don't even know how long, even before I was vegan, but my kids liked them. And, uh, they were like, you know, they were like huge fans, but my wife couldn't even eat them. I, I could like tolerate them, but like, it's, it's like too realistic. So if this company can do better than what's out there already, and it seems like that's their aim, um, people will have no excuse hopefully to keep eating fish. And then as they point out, you know, if, if people are eating these um, products, they're composed of lentils, chickpeas, and fava beans. They're free from gluten, dairy, GMOs, and um, of course, the harmful ingredients of mercury, plastic, and microfibers that you would get in the ocean-based, um, uh, you know, fish. So, yeah, you can see, you know, here's some, like, I guess, like, fish burger kind of, you know, replacements or whatever. And um, they're talking about how they're going to, market this into different countries and all this kind of stuff so yeah okay i'm not going to feed that troll um good for you i guess uh next one uh pretty good um story is uh this 25 year old pub uh called the carlton tap um 
they've changed their menu to be fully vegan. So this is great news. They've been in operation for 25 years and they got a new um, uh, chef in because I guess this, uh, this person had a very popular, um, um, what do you call it? Like a food, yeah, it says street food pop-up where they were doing like Mexican food and uh, they were getting so popular that they hired this person and she reworked the whole uh, menu and took over the kitchen and made everything fully vegan. So I think, you know, hats off to them and uh, look at this, you know, sample of the food they have. Looks great to me. And, um, you know, people are, people are changing. So I think, you know, the, the answer is there, people. <laughs> we just have to do it. Um, <laughs> David says, it's funny how vegans will complain the alternatives uh, taste uh, too much like the real thing. It's hard to please everyone. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, but I think it's great, you know, like, um, I, 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 I think it's, it's good that it tastes the same way. Like, um, and my wife's happy too, because, you know, the, the kids like it. So like, she doesn't have to eat it and she's happy eating a bunch of other things. So she doesn't care. And for anybody who wants that taste, like, yeah, it's, it's perfect. I mean, like there's just no excuse to be eating like fish, you know, you can just get the vegan version. And I mean, I'm, I'm very upfront and honest. Like when I taste stuff, I, I let people know, like, if I don't think it's like bang on, and then I let them know, you know, it's still tasty, but it's not like the original thing. But with this, it's like the texture, the taste. I mean, it's just, it's exactly like it. I mean, it's crazy. It even flakes apart almost like the real fish. So, uh, yeah, it's just really, there's no, there's no excuse. <laughs> and um, what's next? Oh, yeah, this one. This is a uh, kind of a counter to what I said, you know, that like people are changing and whatever. And this just goes to show you kind of like the opposite of when the industries, uh, you know, have their way and they get all the government subsidies. And this is the kind of thing I was talking about in the last episode uh, where we talked about the lobbying efforts from the animal agriculture industries. And this is in Canada. So basically uh, the um, Prime Minister Trudeau, he basically went and met with the dairy farmers after the um, new uh, United States Mexico Canada trade agreement um, was was I guess accepted or put into place. I don't know if it's actually implemented yet or not, but it it negatively impacts the Canadian dairy farmers. So they, you know, here's the crux of the article: they stand to lose 3.59 percent of their market to the U.S. producers, and then they're basically looking to the Canadian government to compensate them somehow. And um, you know, they're basically. Uh, talk about how I guess in some previous um, you know free trade agreement they've already lost uh, market share and all this kind of stuff and that the government you know needs to like help them out and blah 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 and um, you know I think you know again these these industries are very powerful they end up you know basically appropriating a large portion of um, like uh, you know a large portion of, of the of the tax money and all this kind of stuff. They get a ton of handouts and, um, you know, it's, it's going in the wrong direction. Like people need to realize like, you know, dairy is scary and there are better ways and better things to farm. Just like I talked about previously, there are dairies that, you know, close their doors after 90 years and switch to making plant milks. It's like, that's the future. People need to, um, do this. And I don't think government subsidies should be spent on, you know, getting these companies like more and more time to delay and, and hang on by, you know, our tax money. So it's like if, if anybody's in Canada watching, like definitely, you know, let your voice be heard uh, to your elected politicians. And same goes for anywhere else where there's heavy subsidies like in the U.S. and Europe. Um, it's it's ridiculous. Like we should not be subsidizing these companies. All right. Um, I've gotten to the end of the news articles and I just want to do a few shout outs here and, um, maybe get you guys hip to some channels that you might not be aware of. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Gabe music. Um, Gabe has some awesome, uh, music, obviously, um, that's his thing. He's, uh, got a lot of covers, uh, great voice, great guitar playing, really enjoy it. But uh, I also want to point out that uh, he has a fantastic, oh shoot, I clicked on one by mistake, sorry. I want to show you the bottom video here. Um, one of his earliest videos here. 
this song uh, called Ain't No Way is um, very much a beautiful uh, song about the way we treat animals. And um, it, it's from the animal's perspective and basically just says that like, you know, there's, there's just no way that, that uh, they deserve to be treated the way they, they get treated. I think it's a beautiful song, beautiful lyrics. Like um, there are some pictures of animals, uh, nothing crazy graphic. So if, like somebody's sensitive to that, but, um, but there are, you know, animals in clearly distressing situations in the video. So I just give that as a caveat, but uh, check out Gabe, subscribe to his channel, show him some love. Uh, he's on Twitter as well. That's where I um, came across him first. And uh, yeah, really great supporter and um, really just want to share the love. He's, he's great. He needs more subscribers, really good voice. And this, you know, this video, this song, I don't know how this isn't like a, you know, million view, like, um, like video. It's, it's amazing music and beautiful message. Like I encourage everybody to just share the heck out of this thing. Like just give it to everybody on your Facebook or, you know, other social uh, media platforms. Uh, yeah. G Gabe's the man, like check out some of his songs, really good stuff. Okay, and um, another shout out here to somebody that I've already done a uh, shout out to, which is uh, Swag Vegan. And um, Swag's a great guy, and he has um, a lot of great insights on a lot of different topics. Very well read, um, well rounded uh, person. And unfortunately, he's had a little bit of bad luck. Um, he has tried to remain, um, you know, anonymous, um, so he doesn't use his real name. And um, for I don't know the exact details because uh, he hasn't really made it, you know, um, 100% clear exactly what happened. But uh, but basically, um, somebody has kind of compromised his channel and um, and compromised his anonymity to some extent, and he's actually deleted his channel. So the Swag Vegan channel is no longer there, and um, he has made a new channel. Uh, the channel's name is called Clandestine Carrot Consumer, and. Um, I was uh, the, I believe, either fourth or fifth subscriber. So please, everybody, go and subscribe to Swag Vegan now, clandestine carrot consumer, um, and support him. And uh, he's going to be posting a lot of new stuff and posting some of his old videos back on this channel as well. So I definitely, you know, um, yeah, I recommend checking that out. And I think that was my last one. Yeah, that was the last one. Cool. Let me stop sharing and get back to the chat. Um, David says, thanks for another great stream. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for being on. Um, Dominion is free to watch as of today. That is right. And um, I will definitely be watching that. I have not seen it yet, but um, I will definitely be watching that. Um, I don't know how other people feel about that kind of, um, you know, video. I remember watching Earthlings uh, after I had already gone vegan. And uh, I have to say, like, that was just so powerful and and uh, really heart-wrenching to watch. I mean, I, I pretty much didn't even really want to watch it. It was, I had to stop it several times. It was, like, just very emotional. I But I, I thought it was important to get through it, and I really just kind of wanted to see, um, you know, what what the whole movie was about because when I had made a decision to go vegan, um, it was like, uh, you know, primarily based around the food aspects of it. And I certainly was not aware like of the other kind of aspects of animal um, usage and exploitation. Uh, so things like, um, you know, the clothing industry, I was, I was like fairly familiar with stuff like, like, especially about, um, you know, like, like leather and, um, and fur, fur being the most obvious one, because I think a lot of people are, are aware of that. But uh, I was not aware of like wool or other kinds of things. And I definitely didn't have um, a good perspective on animal testing or, you know, animals um, in uh, entertainment kind of um, exploitation. And uh, I think that was like very powerful. So uh, I haven't seen Dominion yet, um, but basically it's I guess the more modern and uh, Australian version of Earthlings. So, um, okay, David says, I haven't watched it yet. My friend did, and she said it was worse than Earthlings. I mean, that says a lot. <laughs> um, I, I expect it to be like horrendously emotional then and a tearjerker. But in, in my mind, as a, you know, as somebody who advocates for 
a you know vegan lifestyle and vegan diet i think it's important to watch these things because it really kind of like stokes a fire in you to keep going and to get people to be more um i don't know just like like be more passionate about it and i think you know there's definitely a like a time and a place for being like really like uh you know passionate and like sometimes it's easy to forget like what you know what it is we're doing this for and you know i think it's really like veganism is a very beautiful thing because it really um is kind of three things in one i mean you're you're improving your own life your own health you're saving lives um you know of these beautiful animals that uh you know don't deserve to be exploited and used and killed um and then you're also like you know lessening your impact on the environment and and um reducing you know the destruction of forests and you know wild areas so it's like it's just a win all around it's like like how could you not want to do it and um i think watching these kind of movies kind of re-inspires me sometimes to to just see that I, I try not to look away when I see these kind of, you know, animal abuse videos and stuff. Like sometimes they get shared on Twitter or Facebook. And yeah, if you're already vegan, like sometimes it's just like, you don't even want to see that stuff. Cause it's like, you already know it's not really going to change your perspective per se, but uh, yeah, I just don't want to, I don't want to lose that fire. So I'll definitely be watching it. And um, like David says, uh, you can just go to watch dominion.org uh, and, um, and you can just watch the whole movie from there. So, yeah, that's it for today, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I don't know if anybody has anything else they want to mention or if anybody else needs a shout-out or anything like that. Feel free to speak now. <laughs> or speak in the next one. <laughs> So cool, man. Thanks, everybody. Um, we will do another one probably next week and uh, see you guys then. Cheers.